This is Health and Society, a podcast series featuring early career researchers from the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London, with interviewer Nigel Warburton. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk. Hello, I'm Nigel Warburton. Joining me today is Suzanne Snowden, an ESRC-sponsored PhD candidate in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London. Susie, we're going to focus on research and the Mental Capacity Act. What is the Mental Capacity Act? The Mental Capacity Act is a piece of legislation that was passed in 2005 and came into force in 2007. And it protects people who might be considered vulnerable when making decisions that might affect the care or financial decisions that they need to make at the time those decisions need to be made. And it only covers adults, so from age 18 plus, and it only applies in England and Wales. So if I'm doing a piece of research involving people who might have some kind of mental incapacity, what do I have to do? What sort of hurdles do I have to jump over? You have to complete what's known as the two-step test. And the two-step test consists of two questions. The first of these questions is, does this person have an impairment in their mind or brain that might affect their ability to make a decision for themselves? Okay, so we assess that and I say, look, the person in front of me clearly doesn't have an impairment. If the person doesn't have an impairment, then you're good to go. You can get their consent, give them the information sheet and carry on with research as normal. But in most cases where this is relevant, we're going to recognise that potentially at least somebody has some kind of limitation, some way in which they will be covered by the Act. What then? So then you need to go on to the second stage of this two-step test, and this is your capacity to consent assessment. It's more like a conversation with your potential participant, but in that conversation, they have to demonstrate that they can do four things. The first of these is that they can understand about the project, about research in general, and what it is that you want from them. The second is that they can retain that information at least for as long as that conversation continues. The third is that they can weigh up the risks and benefits of taking part in the project and if they understand the consequences of being involved or not being involved. And the fourth is that they can communicate that decision back to you, which of course you would think is always going to be uh, with language, verbal language, but when it comes to people with dementia, sometimes that might involve a hand squeeze or a hand stroke or even a blink. It really depends on the person. So if I were having that conversation with you consenting to be in this podcast, obviously you do have capacity, but say I thought that maybe there's some hints that you didn't have a capacity to, to consent and give informed consent to being engaged in this podcast. I go through a conversation with you ticking off those four questions If I think that you are okay on all those four questions, it's, once again, can I go ahead and do the interview? Absolutely, yeah. Then you'll go on to just get consent from the person, get that written down, signed, and off you go. But what if in one or two of those areas you fall short of meeting the criteria? What then? If you don't meet even one of those four, then that means you are deemed as lacking the capacity to consent to participate in that project. So it's just for that decision. That doesn't mean that I can no longer make any decisions at all. All the conversation was was for this one decision. So the decision in relation to the particular piece of research that you want to carry out? Yeah. At that moment? At that moment, yes. Because I could imagine that six months later, somebody with dementia is going to be a very different issue potentially from the moment when you do this test. Presumably you have to go through this checklist at the very moment when you are going to do the piece of research. Yes, there's some designs, for example, you might want to do an interview with a person once every three months, and so it would be best to assess their capacity at the beginning of every one. And this has to be recorded as well, this is part of the act, that it's not just, oh yeah, I ticked that box, it has to be physically recorded. Yes, it's very important to use a tool. Now, there are some already published tools out there that contain all those four criteria, but you can, you can create your own tool, you don't have to use anything that's already you know, been published. But the main point is that you have to keep adequate records of what you've done, otherwise... It could, it's just your word against somebody else's that you sought consent and, and it'd be tempting obviously to bypass that. Yes, you've got that record and since it's 
entirely likely that you may be with, with the person alone. It's good to have it written down what happened. Uh, if you're a researcher, you should be abiding by ethical and moral written and unwritten rules anyway. So I would like to think that a researcher wouldn't just say, oh, hey, this person has capacity just because they're desperate to have them in their project. I mean, that's, that's wrong. So imagine I, I go through there, I failed on at least one of those questions, I don't meet the criteria. Does that mean I can't be part of your research? Absolutely not. And this is why the Mental Capacity Act is very clear on the next few steps. Now, if you, I was doing this four-step assessment for any other type of decision not to do with research, then I would talk to that person's lasting power of attorney. But when it comes to research, the process is very different, which is why I was very keen to talk about it today. What you do is you find a person who is interested in the welfare of that person, such as their spouse, I don't know, adult child, for example, and they become that person's personal consultee. And what you're doing with this personal consultee is talking to them about what they perceive the potential participants' views and wishes would be had they the capacity to consent for themselves. So what if the person doesn't have a close relative to hand who's prepared to do that? Does that mean they can't be part of the research? No, this is written in the Mental Capacity Act too. So if there's no personal consultee, then you find a nominated consultee. And the difference with this person is this person could be a paid professional, whereas a personal consultee, they cannot be a paid professional involved with that person, whereas this nominated consultee could indeed be maybe their solicitor or GP or a social worker who knows the person and can advise you on what they perceive the person's wishes would be. Are you saying that the personal consultee or the nominated consultee is a proxy, somebody who stands in giving consent for somebody who we assume would have given consent had they been able to give consent? I want to make very clear the difference I see between the word proxy and a personal consultee. A proxy is someone who is giving consent on behalf of that person. It's like they're that person's voice, whereas a personal consultee very clearly needs to be aware that they have to advise on what they know the person's wishes would be themselves. Just to play devil's advocate here, if I'm in a position of not being able to give my consent, there are some people, some relatives of mine that I would like to have that power of consultee and others that I wouldn't, and they wouldn't necessarily give the same answer. A researcher should always find out from maybe the gatekeeper or other people around that person with dementia what their wishes might be anyway. It's possible that that person with dementia maybe wrote a statement of advanced wishes about maybe in in case they were asked to be in research in the future. I don't think it's very likely, but I guess you do just have to trust the personal consultee's opinions. Presumably you could be a researcher, a potential research subject could meet all the criteria, but you might still have qualms, even though within the Mental Capacity Act you would legitimately have the right to include that person in your research, you might still have a hesitation about it. Absolutely, and the Act does say that even if the personal consultee said that it might be all right, you should certainly be still viewing that person, maybe look at their body language. Does this person want to be in my focus group? Are they, not just are they running out the door, but are they shouting, are they looking away? You know, look at that person for any cues that might indicate they don't want to be there. What if somebody is deemed by their consultee unsuitable for this sort of attention, that they, they can't give consent and they wouldn't have wanted to do this? Does that mean you can't do research that relates to those people? Actually, no, because the final decision still lays with the researcher. That personal consultee, again, yes, could have said, I don't think this person would have wanted to be involved, but the guidelines do state that the final decision stays with the researcher. However, in my case, these personal consultees, I wanted to be participants at a later stage of my project, and it was in my best interest to keep them on my side. And it was very important that I made sure that relationships with the care home within which I was doing this research were maintained, and I certainly didn't want to be the cause of any upset in such a delicate and sensitive topic. So it's really interesting because th- that means the consultee doesn't have the power of veto. All you have to do within the Mental Capacity Act 
is proof that you involved a consultant. Yes, you have to show that you consulted carers even before you've done that capacity assessment and then, of course, when you ask them to be a personal consultee later. Just let me try and summarise where we've got to here. If you're going to do some research that might fall under the Mental Capacity Act, the first question you have to ask is, does the person I'm interviewing, that does the person who's going to be involved in my research have some kind of impairment? If not, it's a normal consent, an adult can consent to take part in the research, no problem. If they do have some kind of impairment, you ask them a further four questions in conversation, keep a record of the answers. If they fail on one of those four questions to demonstrate capacity to give consent, then at that point you have to bring somebody else in. You have to have some kind of consultee, either a personal consultee who's a a friend, a relative, somebody who's close to the person who can give their opinion about whether this person would have given consent, or you get a, a, a less closely connected kind of consultee who's a nominated consultee, who, like a solicitor or a doctor perhaps, who can take that role themselves. Now as a researcher, you're not obliged to go with the view of the consultee, it's something that goes into the mix. You make the decision on the basis of that. So you make a decision and you record your decisions. And that's the good thing about the Mental Capacity Act is that it forces researchers to do that. Now, what's your experience of this sort of process in practice? It takes a long time. It's very easy for researchers to design a project that you think, oh, well, this assessment business will only be done in a couple of weeks. It's going to take ages. You've got letters to send. You've got responses to wait for. You might have to involve your gatekeepers to keep nudging those personal consultees. Hey, call that researcher back. You've got to rely on a lot of people and design a lot of time for that aspect of it, whereas you wouldn't before necessarily. So this is a kind of safeguard nevertheless. So it's not, although it's a hassle for the researcher, it's a hassle which means both that the appropriate consultation has gone on, but also that you have a record that it has gone on, so that the the researcher is protected if there's ever any question about this as well. Absolutely, you're protecting yourself and you're protecting the people that you want to do research on too. So you've just completed your PhD on dementia and you've had to use the Mental Capacity Act in, in getting permission, getting consent where possible for people to be involved in your research. What advice would you give somebody just setting out in this area? I think it's really important to talk to someone who's gone through it. I had an informal conversation with an old age psychiatrist actually to understand about this conversation, these four things that I need to get from the person. And we role played what it's like because at at least at the time there were no videos on the internet of what one might look like. There was no formal training for researchers. I did do some training for care home managers on how to do this capacity assessment. But since the things that you do afterwards are different for researchers, it, it was helpful, but it wasn't that helpful. So, yeah, talk to someone who's, been, who's gone through it. There are easy read versions of what to do around. There is the code of practice that comes with the Mental Capacity Act that sets it all out in lay language very, very clearly. And in terms of doing the assessments, One of the easiest things for me was to have a loved one or someone known to that person with dementia with them. They could help interpret that person with dementia's behaviours or or noises or, or body language to help me to understand whether they understood what I was saying to them. The carers who were around helped me to change what I was saying to make to get my message across so I wanted to look at care records and instead of saying care records a carer said just say your big blue book that's what we say here at the care home and for me just knowing that really helped my communication with these people. Suzanne Snowden thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Health and Society. This podcast series is sponsored by the Educational Fund and produced by Aidan Judd and Ellie Clifford. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk.